sure how many of you have been in the American uh, or the National Museum of American History in the Smithsonian. How many of you have seen that? That's one of the more spectacular things you can ever do. When you are in there, sooner or later you will walk into the room where this picture was taken. That's obviously the American flag, but it's not just a Star Spangled Banner, it's the Star Spangled Banner, the one that Francis Scott Key was actually looking at when he wrote the poem in 1814. So my topic tonight is the Star Spangled Banner. It's one of those things that all of us are so familiar with, we don't know anything about it. So our story starts with the War of 1812. Now all of you remember all of the details of the War of 1812. You, from your mm -hmm. U.S. history class, this is the time when you want to look thoughtful and not like, like you really do. You probably don't know much about that war because it gets about that much in a typical U.S. history book. It had a weird start and inconclusive set of events and a bizarre ending where the last battle of the war was fought three months after the peace treaty was signed. But in any event, the war started because the new United States, which was about 30 years old at the time, was angry with the British because the British were taking American sailors off of American ships. Remember the impressment you probably heard about? Also, the new United States decided that maybe they could kick the British out of Canada and take that over too because the British were busy at the moment fighting Napoleon in Europe. Well, as bad luck would have it for the United States, the British and their allies beat Napoleon in the spring of 1814. And then they turned to look across the ocean where the irritating Americans had been bothering them for a number of years. So 5,000 battle-hardened British troops showed up uh, in the area, kind of in between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., one happy fall day. And those troops had just beaten Napoleon. They were the best soldiers on Earth, and the American army was probably the weakest and worst on Earth. The British troops lined up for battle against <clears throat> about 5,000 of British troops lined up for battle against an army of 15,000 Americans, and within a half hour, the Americans were running for their lives. And the British thought, this is perfect, because what they had in mind was cutting the country in half, and then they could dispose of each half of it. So the British troops turned south a little bit and invaded Washington, D.C. Remember that story about how Dolly Madison rolled up the picture of George Washington and they got out of the White House? That really happened. The President Madison and his wife Dolly got out, got out of the White House back door about 20 minutes before the British showed up at the front door. <clears throat> the British burned most of the city. They burned the White House, burned the Capitol building, a bunch of other things, looted pretty much whatever there was to take, and then turned north to head to Baltimore. Baltimore was the third largest American city at the time after Philadelphia and New York in that order. And the idea was that if they could capture Baltimore, they could capture a commercial hub and stop Thing stopped the country from functioning basically because they'd eliminated the capital and then they could break off the commercial hub too. So the British ground forces marched up and discovered that the Americans were pretty heavily entrenched just south of Baltimore. So they decided the thing to do was to have the British Navy sail up into Baltimore Harbor and uh, uh, take the city there. But to do that, they had to get by a fort called Fort McHenry which is guarded Baltimore Harbor. That's still there today. It's a national park, actually, which we're seeing, too. Well, the British, the British were ready to do that, but at the, when they had captured Washington, D.C., they had arrested this American doctor, a guy named Beadle. And Dr. Beadle was accused of helping, the, helping round up British stragglers and deserters and whatnot. Turned out he didn't do it, but he was accused of doing it. He was being held prisoner on a British ship. His relatives hired Francis Scott Key, a prominent Baltimore lawyer, to go out and negotiate with the British, accompanied by a State Department official. Key, as a private citizen, could offer bribes and, and ransom and whatnot that the government couldn't offer. He was also a very well-regarded guy. So Francis Scott Key, the State Department guy, met with the British uh, officers aboard a ship, and they worked out a deal to release the doctor. But then the British captain said, well, I can't let you go because you've been watching our preparation for the attack on Fort McHenry, so you're going to have to stay on the ship. Now, he was a, a prisoner in a technical sense, but you've got to remember he was a gentleman with a big G, so that meant he ate dinner with the officers and socialized with them and whatnot. He, was a, he just couldn't wait. He was like, more like a permanent guest, I guess you would say. <laughs> yeah. So on the night of September 13th, 1814, the British 
uh, launched their attack on Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor. And their primary weapons, there were two of them, primary weapons were rockets, Congreve rockets that gave off a red flare as they went, and mortars, and the round, the exploding round of the mortars called a bomb. They exploded in midair and showered the ships with shrapnel, or the fort with shrapnel. The idea was to make life unpleasant for the people inside. All night long, this went on, this bombardment. It lasted almost 20 hours, in fact. And Key watched from the, the deck of this British ship, watched all of this happen. And while he was watching it, he started mulling over what he was seeing. And it looked like things were really bad for the Americans in the fort, because it was a large British fleet, you know, well-armed. And in the morning, when the sun came up, there was this enormous American flag, the one that's in the picture there. It's called a garrison flag. The guy who had was commanding Fort McHenry, Major George Armitage, had hired a Baltimore seamstress to make that flag. It's about one-fourth the size of a modern basketball court. I mean, this thing is a monster. Wow. It wow. flew from a 90-foot pole. It was designed to be seen from like 10 miles away, and he was about 8 or 10 miles away on the, on the ship. And when the sun came up, there was the flag. Mm -hmm. And this poem kind of appeared in his mind. He pulled a letter out of his pocket that he was writing to a friend and wrote down the verses of the poem. When he got off shore, or got on shore the next day, he wrote down the words, and what he wrote in the Star Spangled Banner is just a direct description of what he saw. It's not a poem in the symbolic sense. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, meaning the flag. And with broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous flight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly screaming. It's a question. The rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof to the night that our flight was still left. He just described what he saw. Well, he showed this poem to his brother-in-law, who had been in Fort McHenry during the bombardment, and wrote on the side. Wow, great. It was published in a newspaper, and he wrote in the paper that he had in mind it could be sung to the tune of a hundred-year-old British song called Anacreon in Heaven. You may have heard it was, the poem was set to an English drinking song. That's not true. That, that was not a drinking song. It's just a popular song of the day. And from there, the national anthem became uh, an anthem for the military. It wasn't until 1931 that it was actually voted up by Congress to make the national anthem. So our national anthem has been around for a while, but not really for that long as a national anthem. And it was inspired by just what Francis Scott Key was looking at when he when the sun came up and he saw Fort Henry.